The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to show number 34 of As We See It, being recorded on Sunday, March 18th, 2012. And thank you, Gene, for the introduction as always, and welcome to our team. Here today, we want to firstly thank Jill Henley for filling in last week on show 33 for Holly Hurley, who was off for a couple weeks, and I think I hear her in the background there. Holly, is that you? Oh, yes. Oh, Holly's back. Welcome back, Holly. Thank you. (laughs) And so that's Holly Hurley back in St. Louis, along with our regular cast of characters, Fred Boaz in the Pocono Mountains. Hey, guys. The Lobster out in Brookline, Massachusetts. Okay, we didn't wake him up. And as always, G. White out in Los Angeles. Good to have you on with everybody. (laughs) Hello, everybody. (laughs) So, Holly, if you could put a two-week trip into about 30 seconds, welcome back, and how was it? Oh, it was great. I was in China. Um, I was in China with the business school. Um, We did a couple company visits, visited some Chinese companies and a couple of American companies abroad, saw a lot of temples and a lot of neat stuff, and uh, I'm just plum exhausted, quite frankly. (laughs) Even though you weren't able to contribute to any of our shows, if you were able to get online at all, how did you find the internet? Fred had mentioned that, I think it was last week, saying she actually has probably has better internet than we do, because almost all of those countries, specifically like China, is known to be so far advanced technology-wise than we are here. Well, there are there are a lot of huge advance advances uh, on like a personal technology level. But what's difficult in a country like that is getting things like Internet, water and electricity to the masses all the time. There are actually certain hours a day where they'll turn the electricity or the water off in in native areas. And I mean, the hotels we were at were quite nice, but it was it, it there was not Wi-Fi available in our rooms. Uh, only only through an Ethernet cord, and at most of our hotels, that was pretty spotty. So I did not find the Internet particularly easy to access, at least not till we got to Shanghai, but even there our hotel had problems with the Internet, and it's not something that people consider just, they just sort of consider it the way things are. Like nobody really gets upset about it, which I thought was really strange. So I was glad that I uh, had warned you guys I might be in trouble with that because I certainly was. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised because I. What about your cell phone? Thought otherwise. I didn't take my cell phone. Uh, you can easily get a cheap one there to use. It's actually cheaper than converting yours over. Uh, you can usually get a cheap one there to use with the temporary but number. You didn't but. Bother. Yeah, but I didn't bother because, I mean, you know, it, yeah. I was only there for two weeks. It That's didn't it. really seem like a big deal. Exactly. And I guess your husband and everything had ways of reaching you if they needed to. Yeah, I mean, you know, mostly. Well, the hotel, just, they knew what hotel you were at anyway, so. Yeah, exactly. He knew what hotel those at, but for the most part, we just communicated by email, you know, on and off, sort of like I did with you guys, kind of spottily over the trip every now and again. Because right. he did have Wi-Fi in the lobby. So. When you were able to get on. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, if anybody wants to hear about Holly's story in more detail, next Friday's The Crashing Glass podcast is going to be specifically about international chicks. So uh, I'm sure Holly and Jill will be discussing her trip in a lot more detail. So that'll be coming along next Friday. That'll be show 10 of The Crashing Glass podcast. Check that out. And now I guess we're ready to move on to Lobster Tail segment. Larry, what do you have for us? Number one, typewriter is the longest word that can be written using the letters on one row of the keyboard. Number two, your hearing decreases when you overeat. When you eat too much, it actually reduces your ability to hear. So consider eating healthfully and only until you are full. What would you say? I was not going to go there. I'm, I'm, no, I'm actually eating right now, so I had to say, oh. what would you say? Well, okay, your hearing decreases when you overeat. I was pulling your leg, Larry. Okay, move okay. on to number three. 
Heat released by the human body can boil five liters of water in one hour. Number four, when you take a step, you are using 200 muscles. Walking uses a great deal of muscle power, especially if you take your 10,000 steps. Well, we, we said, we've determined, Holly, we're going to put you on the spot. Number four is for you. Number three I'm going to take, I, I don't know, how could you, well, Holly might know something about this too as a trainer. How does the human body put off that much heat that you could boil four liters or so of water? Well, that, that, that I found actually really interesting, Larry. I, I've never heard anything like that before. The site that I found had that in there, and I found it interesting, so I chose it. I did check out number one. If you look at, your, at, at any QWERTY keyboard from a computer or whatever, it does work out. The typewriter is the only word that can be that the longest word that can be typed off of one line. And you have tried them all, huh? <laughs> had nothing to do today, so I went. I, I just looked. I you went through the you went through the out. dictionary, right? <laughs> no, I I looked at the keyboard and said, you know, something. He's actually right. And which, what was you know, which is cool? And what was number two? Your hearing decreases when you overeat. When oh, you yeah? eat too much. Right. We we already covered that because yeah, I, know, I, I, I am eating and I couldn't hear. I seem to think that that's true, though. I, I don't know to what extent your hearing might decrease, but I do know that obviously because of the back pressure in your ears, while you're chewing, you can't necessarily hear because I guess it's sending that back pressure through your ears. Yeah, but you know what? I've been overweight my whole life, and I've, I've got perfect hearing. As a matter of fact, I hear things that my wife and daughter don't hear half the night. In the middle of the night, I'll hear things like the dogs barking, and they'll go, I didn't hear that. You yeah, know, kind of thing. So I kind of, I kind of disagree with that about the uh, decreased he hearing because you're overeating. I, I, don't, right. I disagree with that. Hmm. I guess I'm going to have to eat a gallon of ice cream tomorrow. And, uh, I, I think what, I think what they <laughs> eat, overeating during a meal is what they're saying, not the fact that you overeat in general. In general, right. you're eating is Maybe, they, maybe they, not weight-related, just right, per, right. Per, That's what I think per an individual about. sitting. It's maybe. going to be a great excuse next time my wife says something. <laughs> and number four, the muscle one, Holly. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure that that's probably true. Um, walking is fine. I mean, you know, you use any time that you're upright, you use a lot of different body parts just to hold yourself upright. Stuff you don't even think about, like your abs, your the muscles in your back, you know, the muscles that hold your shoulders back and down, you know, holding your neck upright. So I would I would believe there could be over 100 involved. I mean, I've definitely never done the math before, but... I think that sounds good, and I think it's interesting that this must be Larry from a website that encourages, you know, taking 10,000 steps every day to increase your health. I, I've heard people, I've heard a lot of women talk about that, They, uh, women typically older who don't really want to make significant changes to their lifestyle often will buy a pedometer and try to take 10,000 steps, which isn't bad, but you got to think about people like nurses, you know, they walk that much every day. That's not really going to be a change for women like them, but I think that's still, that's, that's uh, probably very true. Anything that's, that my, that's myself. That's my exercise. I don't exercise. I don't go to a gym or anything. I tend to do a lot of walking and not like you said in a nurse where, I mean, I do a certain amount of work on my day job, uh, walking rather, I certain amount of work on my day job too, although less work than walking. I do a certain amount of walking on that job. I just like to walk in general. I could literally walk, and no, Fred, we won't tell the New York City story. I could literally walk miles and miles. Well, and, you and I, and I guess walked, you and I have walked around Boston oh yeah. pretty much. And you know, I guess I guess that's very good exercise in walking. So you do. I, I think that all fits in with this lobster tail where it's very good exercise and you're working all of your muscles, I guess. It's also found, though, that when, we're there, when you walk a lot, you have a lot more time to think, you're not worried about driving, and it is healthier for you. So. All right. Good. So good lobster tails again this week. Yeah, good so, job, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, very oh, good. Thank you. So, Fred, what do we have on the, uh, I guess it's Fred that's going to get us started off with our regular Yeah, I'll get topic. started off. We have a death on an escalator at the MTA in New York, and this occurred Wednesday of last week. A woman f 
fell, uh, slipped on an escalator, actually fell on an escalator, and wound up dying because her clothes got caught, a scarf or thing got caught on the bottom rung of the escalator, and apparently this escalator in New York City, which is actually in Long Island, in Lindenhurst Station in Long Island, uh, escalator had not been working for a while, and you know had been on and off for repairs. They spent about twenty-five thousand dollars on this thing to repair it over the last few years. The riders have been complaining about it. A woman fell. How many ways can you spell lawsuit? Because this family, especially when, when there's a rider said that the left hand guard, uh, left hand handrail didn't work, the right hand rail worked, and if you, if you held on to the left one, you go over the side. I mean, these guys are are spending twenty four thousand dollars repairing and maintaining it in, in a year. Some lady dies on it. Now they're talking about re- replacing the escalators. Well, you guys should have done this a while back. Well, in, in all fairness, I'm sure, in all fairness to the MTA, I'm sure they're not the only public agency or even private company that has had problems. I mean, look at the elevator in New York City that uh, because of a maintenance mishap, a woman was killed just a couple weeks ago in an elevator. But along the lines of escalators and mass transit, the exact same thing happened here in Boston maybe two years ago now. I believe it was at one of the downtown crossing station escalators. A woman tripped and her scarf or something got tangled up in the escalator. The escalator didn't have any kind of automatic sensing device that would shut down the escalator. And of course, all of the other passengers on the escalator just said, oh, look at this poor woman who tripped in her scarf squat and nobody would hit the emergency stop button and she, exactly. strang- and she strangled herself. Yeah. It's all yeah, it's all about safeties, you know. They, well, the question is, where the hell is the emergency stop button in the first place? Oh, it, it was there, but you know, they yeah. uh, apparently, and from what I could see, just in my not daily, but in my use of going around escalators or elevators, you don't I, elevator yeah a little differently. I guess you have the emergency stop button, but on escalators. As you've probably seen, the stop button is like down on the bottom of where the handrail curves around to return back to the opposite end again. It's like in this out of the way place all the way on the bottom. So there is an emergency shutoff button, but first of all, it's not automated. It's there's no sensor or something that senses a problem like this woman tripping and falling that obviously could have prevented the accident. But then you also have your bystanders who just stand around and have to rubberneck and even literally just laugh and say, oh, look at this idiot. She doesn't even know how to walk. She fell. And that, by the way, was my uh, Chris Christie moment of the week. I called somebody an idiot. You know, she, she, so you have these bystanders just laugh and don't even push the emergency stop button. Like to hold them culpable for it. Fred, what, did you just say you'd like to hold someone like yeah, culpable right. for not? Yeah, having... I'd, like to, I'd like to hold someone a bystanders culpable for for that death if they were there and didn't hit the shop stop or just standing around laughing. Yeah, well, I'm just wondering, were they laughing? I mean, like, I, I didn't get from this article what that there were bystanders or what the hell they. No, were no, doing. no. I'm talking about the the Boston situation a couple of years ago that I was using as an example of the same thing happening in Boston. Well, but I wonder, in, in this case, I do wonder where were the, you know, this is New York City, and I mean, yep. the area, you know, I mean, I've, I've been, I've been at the Lindenhurst stop. There, I'm wondering. There's always at least one other person around. Yeah, I'm was sure. there no one there that could have helped her? I mean, I saw a guy throw himself down the stairs in Brooklyn once. You know, and I mean, we called 911, tried to like help him. You know, like mm-hmm. I mean, I don't understand where were the other people because that's one of the things I always found in New York is one of the comforting things is there are always other people around, for better or for worse, who can help you or call the authorities or at least see what happened. And I, I just don't understand where were these people. And the article doesn't mention anything about there being any other bystanders around or any, any other people out there. So, Unless it was 3 a.m., I don't know if it mentions the time, when Let me check. That, late at lo- at that late at night, it's always possible that she was the only one in the station. Now it just says that she was 88 years old and... See, and, and, and I, I agree with Holly, again, saying that she was 88 years old. I think a lot of people tend to go out of their way for the elderly too you know you you see somebody like that moseying around in the subway station or for a bus or wherever and you know you're obviously always going to let them go first and get out of their way and things like that just a courtesy so it's an amazing story you know what uh, amazes me fred was talking about the uh, one side of the armrest moving the other side not right 
So who's going to be stupid enough to hold on to the one that doesn't move except the one that does Yeah, but move? she may not know it, and, and being 88 years old, she may have needed support. We don't know We don't know the backstory behind it. That's true. We don't know what her faculties are or anything All like right. that. So, yeah, it's a mystery. And remember, I mean, you, we don't know where this woman was from. She happened to be at the Linden her station on the subway. We don't know why she was there or what she was doing. She could have been visiting someone. Like Ed said, we don't know what time of day it was. But, again, this is New York City. I've seen very few. I've been in New York City, and you know this. We've both been in New York City all hours of the day and night. There's always, there's usually always somebody around. Well, that's, that's what Holly even, said, even, sure. even that mugger with a knife could help cut this lady's scarf off, you know. Exactly. And then with your question about the lawsuit, yeah, there's obviously going to be lawsuits involved in this. As I'm sure there were lawsuits involved in the Boston incident that I told the story of. However, that got buried. You never read anything further about that. So the MBTA, I'm sure, just settled with that person's family X amount of dollars, and that was the end of it. It you know, could have very well never have even gone to court. There you know, the have, magic no, and that magic oh, yeah. number. And there was, there was probably a magic there was probably a magic number and they settled out of court. Yeah, that 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 they call it an undisclosed amount. Right. That happens with the company I work for. Uh, the, rarely oh, will yeah, there must be lawsuits major, there all the time. A sure. major news item about something happening there because they usually settle out of court. Sure. I'm sure a company like that gets sued all the time. Yeah. As does I've I've been in the movie theater business for over 30 years, and I can't tell you how many lawsuits I've been involved in as a manager of a movie theater with patrons, mm -hmm. out of all of the lawsuits that I've been involved in that I at least had to go to like an inquest type hearing for, you know, just an informal thing to get the facts out. Out of all of those that I've had to go to, I would say literally one maybe actually ever went to court. Other ones were always settled by the insurance company out of court. Oh yeah, because they want to keep their name out of the media as much as possible. It also winds up being cheaper in the end, especially if they yeah. lose to a jury. Any final thoughts, Holly, before we move on? No, I mean, I think I think that was, I, I think the real point you said kind of that people, it seems like things got covered up, or and I wonder in this case, where you were talking about, I feel like there are a lot of questions left unanswered, and that, that makes me sad. That's so, true. So, I mean, that's, that's the most I could say about it is I just, I wonder where everybody else was, much like the guys do. And I just think it's sad that there are so many questions that will never be answered for us. And I, I really think it's sad for her family. Okay, gang. Uh, for our next story is a California police chief decided he didn't like the facts that a reporter was putting into a newspaper in Berkeley. So he sends a police officer, a police sergeant over there to try to talk the guy into changing the fact. And if that's not a violation of the First Amendment, nothing is. So it's outrageous. He said that, you know, I mean, minutes after reading the article that's supposed to be, the guy sends a, uh, a sergeant over. I mean, here he got some report, and it's 2.30 in the morning yet. He got a sergeant, an armed police sergeant at your door telling the chief doesn't like what you're writing. If that's not intimidation, I don't know, man. I, in reading the article, it, the chief did apologize and all, you know, seemed a sincere enough apology. You know, he didn't go over the top in his apology. He just simply said, uh, yeah, I could have handled this better. I, what more do you want? I'd probably, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm not taking the sides of the chief, but I probably would have apologized the same way, unfortunately. You know, he, he did say, well, yeah, I guess I could have handled this much better. So you know, I, you I think know, I, I thought that was the interesting thing about the story is it definitely seemed like this was sincerely an accident. Yeah. Like just from what I said, but I got to say though, I But was not at 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't send uh, the that police was, knocking was, on the door. It was 12:45. <laughs> it was 1 o'clock in the morning in all right, fairness, right, but I mean, right. I'm kind of with the with the reporter in that you if a police officer knocks on your door at 1 o'clock in the morning, you think someone has died. Of course. And I think that the unfortunate thing is you know, that was just not a very good way for that to go down. Yeah, I this, mean, could, this couldn't wait till 8 o'clock in the morning? On the phone, don't show up at his house with a gun. Right, or it couldn't wait till 8 o'clock in the morning? Right. It, it might not no, it might not have been able to, because remember, they got to run the presses early. So 2.30 in the morning, it might have had to go at 2.30 in the morning, but something could have probably settled with a phone call. No, and it's right? also, if, 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 you're talking, if you're talking 
old-time media, as in press, newspapers, or even certainly, or even certainly in new media, where it happens even faster, there's a thing called a retraction. You print it. If it's wrong, you retract it. So yes, right. it could have waited till eight o'clock the next morning. I thought the story was great because of the way the chief handled it. He said at least he apologized, and he made an effort at it. But I just thought it was funny that sending somebody over two thirty in the morning because you don't like the facts of the story. I mean, if that's not, I mean, what's this guy gonna do? Uh, 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 oh, oh, okay, I'll, okay. No, you you have to wonder if there was an intimidation factor or something going on here where it would have violated the uh, amendment rights but or if it was indeed just a miscalculation on his part that would have been viol it would have been a violation of freedom of speech there that's for sure Sure. Yeah, first absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's, I think the timing was the, the timing was sort of the suspect part. You know, how important is this that you got to go to this reporter's house at one o'clock in the morning? And was that an accident or was that, or was that, as you say, intimidation and planned? And gosh, I hope it was an accident. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and take the next one. Um, so this one's really, I don't know, frightening's the word. So the, so the Georgia, a Georgia man who actually shot another shot and killed another father in front of his child's daycare center in front of both of their children's daycare center uh was sentenced this week and basically they sentenced him to the equivalent of life in prison uh, it's going to be 30 years and uh, during which they're going to basically take a look at his mental capacity because they think there's a possibility he's mentally ill but that was not proven in court um, and then if they find that he's not mentally ill he will receive life in prison without parole um, but he basically shot this guy execution style uh, in front of their their children's you know el uh, elementary school, uh, uh, which I just think is unbelievable. I, I can't imagine. The funny part about it is that after the verdict was delivered, he was described as a, his brother describes him as a good provider, devoted son, wonderful brother, great father with two children. Aren't they and always? I mean, what did Charles Manson's murder, uh, neighbors say? He was a he was a quiet tenant. These guys, I don't know, the guy got what he deserved. The little kids out, the other guys out of a father's probably, I mean, when, you know, I, what uh, always irked me is you have a person commits a murder, sane or insane, and they're found not guilty by reason of insanity. How about we change the sentencing or change the ruling to guilty but not responsible because of a mental defect? Because the guy still killed someone, and he is guilty. Well, that's essentially what the what the actual sentence was, and also the limitless potential quote is from the brother of the uh, of the guy who was shot, not not of not of the guy who did the shooting. Uh, no, I, I, I meant to, yeah. Yeah, that guy. I mean, no, I, they they don't have any quotes what anybody thought about that guy. They just talked a lot about because the guy he shot was actually a Harvard graduate, very active in the community, all that sort of stuff. He had an MBA actually from Harvard. But this is basically what the sentencing is. That's what you know. There were three options they were given. One of them was just plain guilty. The other one was not guilty by reason of mental insanity. And then there's this one in the middle, which they suspect he might have been mentally ill, but they definitely find him guilty. And the other option was guilty, you know, and, and I mean, so this is basically the option that says, listen, I don't care if you're mentally ill or not. You planned this thing for because apparently he staked this guy out. He stalked him. He tried to wear a costume like there was there was apparently all kinds of stuff going on here. And he the gentleman who did the shooting, his last name was Newman. Uh, he was actually the supervisor of this guy's wife. And so there is some speculation that perhaps he shot the husband in response to something the wife told him, but they were completely unable to prove her involvement. And so apparently his mentally ill plea is going to depend largely upon what happens. There haven't been any charges brought on her yet, which I think is interesting because mm -hmm. apparently they suspect that she was involved but have been completely unable to prove it. And so like I think she said, got the better lawyer, that's for sure. And like you said, it wasn't, nobody's proven him mentally ill yet. So it's all tentative on based on the uh, prison psychiatrist or prison psychiatrist uh, department findings as to whether he remains in jail or gets a life sentence or whether he uh, winds up with a third, with the third, so I, thirty. So I think life. I think Fred, your gist of this point is the, whatever whatever we're going to call the actual sentencing, like the sentencing guidelines or whatever, about is this. Innocent, you know, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, or guilty. It's guilty. It's guilty basically by reason of insanity. Well, no, it's guilty but mentally ill. There's a difference right. because 
people are found not guilty by reason of insanity. And I understand what they're trying to say. But the idea is that you still got a person dead in the street. The guy's guilty. He committed the crime. But if by you're, saying, you're, if, but if saying not guilty, guilty he's it, not guilty. It should be changed nationally to right. what they, for what they had in Georgia. Guilty, but mentally ill. Which is a whole big difference. Yeah, because otherwise you know, they, you're they, saying they, they, he's not guilty. Yeah, because they're trying to find... They found David Chapman not guilty right. of killing John Lennon. Not guilty by reason of insanity. No, no, no. You're guilty. John Lennon's he's dead. dead right. Guilty. Exactly. You did it. But you're not... You're mentally ill, so it's guilty, but mentally ill. So that right. may spare them the death penalty. You're still guilty. It's still guilty. And that's always bothered me, because not guilty means you didn't do it. It doesn't mean did it but you're mentally ill it means it, or not responsible it means you did, not guilty means you didn't do it i don't know if there's a precedent for this but i kind of agree with fred oh i do too i i like that theory that why he and he says it eloquently for fred <laughs> why why would you say you, you have a dead body how could you say not guilty he's guilty you have a dead body yeah. Hopefully you have any politicians listening. We can get some laws changed. Yeah, I mean that would be. I. I mean I don't know. I. Don't, I don't know. I. I, I don't know. I. Just, I don't know what the precedence is for this kind of ruling. But I actually found it very comforting, Fred, that they were basically saying, "Listen, we know the guy's guilty, and we're not sure necessarily if he's mentally ill, but we certainly think he deserves some significant prison time. So let's let let's let that happen. And then if we, if if it turns out he wasn't." mentally ill maybe in 30 years we might consider paroling him but we're going to wait that long because i definitely don't want this guy on the street i don't care if he's mentally ill or not i don't want him on the street and i don't even want him under just under a, in a mental hospital i want him in jail i think it's interesting they added insult to injury by charging him uh, with using a firearm in the commission of a felony and gave him an additional five years that he's going to serve concurrently with his life sentence i, I know as if to say like we also yeah, know, that you, yeah, we also know that you shot a firearm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, I found that comical, actually, because yeah, they also ruled too. it to serve concurrently, so what's the point? Well, why don't we lighten it up a little bit with our Who Cares segment, uh, a.k.a. entertainment, and then we could get back on the track to some other things. What do we have in our Who Let's Cares see, segment one. today? Gene, we have something? Yeah, you guys all remember Steve Urkel from Family Matters, Julia White. All right, Fred, say it. He hasn't gotten to the point yet. Let him get to it. Let him get to it. I'll say it. <laughs> he gets another boost in his career. He's going to be on Dancing with the Stars, which for me Who cares? Who cares? I, I, I don't get it when it goes to <laughs> Hey, I happen to like Julia White. I used to love Steve Urkel on Family Matters. But uh, I think it's great for him. I really do. I mean, uh, the guy's, you know, guy had a, a decent career. And he wants to boost it a little bit, so he's going to be on Dancing with the Stars. His daughter is excited, even though he says his daughter is not going to be in the audience to watch him. But I think it's pretty cool. I really do. I'm in. I love him. I think he's great. Family Matters was totally the show that everyone watched when we were kids. We all did the Urkel at my elementary school. I love me some Julia White, and I'm very, very happy that he's going to be on Dancing with the Stars. And Maybe so, but I don't watch Urkel. Dancing with the Stars, so I don't care. Well, that maybe you'll have to start now that Jaleel White's going to be on. I didn't. I didn't watch it when Bristol Palin was on, and I'm not going to watch it for him. I don't watch. Hey, it anyway. I think this is very different than Bristol Palin. <laughs> Come on, this guy at least was on a television show for an extended amount of time. He had his own dance. Oh, he that's right. Dance. She wants a television show. Well, you know, yeah. we, we had this, dis this discussion before the show came on the air, and, you know, my question is, here's Dancing with the Stars, and you have, you have Bristol Palin on, and you have Kate Goslin on. What makes these people stars or celebrities that they are called stars? We're creating celebrities out of people that have done nothing except live off of somebody else's name. Bristol Palin is only who she is because her mother was governor of Alaska. No, no. Let's let's take that back. Bristol Palin is only who she is because her mother was a failed candidate for the United States vice president position and Precisely. has since ruthlessly touted the media. And I, I love the joke that The Daily Show made about, like, you know, when she showed up at uh, whatever the corn polls were or whatever in Iowa, they were like, why is she here? She's not running for president. Like, she's just taking up space and making noise she just she is relentlessly chased the media i think this is a very different situation jaleel white has a tv show out right now he is there he's actually stumping for something he is an actor he's actually he's act. 
Yeah, yeah, and maybe he's got some talent too. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Jaleel, he, Jaleel White actually had right. talent. Remember, in the show, when I only watched a few of it, he played actually two parts at at times when he played himself and whatever uh, Stefan Urkel, whatever they want to call him. Yeah, yeah. He, he's actually a very talented young actor, and I wish him luck. And I'd like to see him get another series. Hint, hint, hint. Get he back has one. Here. Yeah. Yeah, it's on the Sci-Fi Channel. Total Blackouts coming yeah. out in April. That's why he's doing. That's the why show. he's doing this. Yeah. Uh, That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm happy. For him. I really am. I, I I like the kid. Best part of that show though was the car he drove. I think that show was his suspenders, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> so those of you who are Dancing with the Stars aficionados and love the show, okay. the uh, person that <laughs> the person that's going to be uh, dancing with Steve Urkel is Kim Johnson, and she's love very her. Good. And who's Kim Johnson? She is the former Australian Mirapaw Trophy uh, winner who came over to the States after, uh, after she won the Australia version a couple times. And she danced with the Hoff. She's had some really bogus partners in her time. But I think she yes. actually, uh, Jean, correct me if I'm wrong, was she dancing with Heinz Ward when he won yes. the Mirabal? Yeah, so yes. she's won the yes. one over here, too. Oh, yeah. man. And this, and this is a paid gig or this is a hobby or what the heck is this? This sounds, get paid for this it. sounds bogus to me, this whole what show. What sounds bogus? What, this what whole fun? show, Dancing with the Stars. Who cares? <laughs> I I agree with Fred. This whole show sounds bogus. Yeah, at least these are people with talent, guys. I'm sorry, but listen. I just don't watch it. That's why I'm picking on it. Of course. Well, here's the thing. These dancers, I mean, it takes enormous amounts of commitment and money and time and effort to become really good at ballroom dancing. And this gives these performers, because that's what they are, a bigger audience. It brings this art to the masses, which has been lost. I mean, if you've ever looked at the evolution of dance, you know, I mean, most people just bump and grind these days. And here are people with right. real talent moving with the rhythm and not just doing something sexual. Although It's definitely it's more professional. Exactly, and yeah. I think this is a fabulous show, and I think it's a good format, and I think it's also only, fun to watch celebrities do something. The only thing I know about the show is I get yelled at every time it's on. You know what's crazy, Fred, and I don't know if you'd be willing to admit this, but you know John always always like complains and rolls his eyes, but he watches the whole thing with me, and he actually <laughs> really cares who wins. Like he tries to be cool about it, like he's not interested. But what ends up happening? It kind of sucks you in. I used to be like that with shows. I used to be like that with shows like Dallas and stuff back in the day. I would sit there and I'd roll my eyes and I'd say, "Why am I watching this crap?" But I'd sit there and I'd watch the crap and I'd get into it. Personally, it was personally it was good crap. So. Yeah, and I, that's how I feel about Dancing with the Stars, but maybe that's just me. Well, speaking of uh, some good crap, Yahoo is suing Facebook. Woohoo! What, okay, now why are you woohooing, Fred? This is what I want. It's too little, too late. Yahoo's down to tubes anyway. They won't even be in existence a year from now. So. No, I'm saying because I mean, if what they're saying is true, then they deserve, and then Facebook deserves to get sued. Well, in, enlighten our listeners that might not be aware of the lawsuit. Well, yeah, so apparently Yahoo is saying that, you know, there are 10 patents that that include, like, methods and systems and things that they use there at Yahoo, uh, things like uh, how to protect people from certain kinds of advertising, you know, like if you click on something, not giving all your information away, all that sort of stuff. So Yahoo is basically trying to insinuate that Facebook sold some of this stuff from them. And, you know, typically in very, very traditional Zuckerberg style, Facebook has basically said, listen, you know, Facebook is not novel. It's based on a lot of ideas that a lot of people have had. The problem with, I just, I feel like Yahoo is is running into patent troll territory here because things like social networking technology, a lot of people come up with a lot of ideas uh, at the same time. A lot of people get them from a lot of places. And, you know, there are hundreds of patents that are outstanding for almost any technology you use on the web. And it's become a problem in the last few years. And I just don't understand, like, I just think this is dirty territory for Yahoo to be getting into. I'm sorry. And I think Google paid them off because that's what Google does. Google tries to prevent patent trolling by basically just paying paying people for dozens of patents at a time. But I just think this is a cheap move. I don't know. Maybe it's me. And, you know, people are vulnerable when they move into an IPO process. And this is not an exception. Yeah. And Yahoo is, as, as I led in with, Yahoo is not in good shape anyway. There is a very good possibility that Yahoo won't be in existence a year down the road. So, you know, this could be another one of those grasping at last straws type of efforts. Again, Either a, a that, long... they might be looking for a buyout, too. 
You know, we well, sue you, you buy us. Well, they've they've been looking for that, so sure, it could all play into that. Yeah, but they haven't yet valued themselves no, in a way that no. anybody would want to pick them up. That's the no. problem, is Yahoo has been apparently seeking people to buy them, but they're overcharging. Yeah, and... Yahoo, Yahoo was Google 10 years ago, but Yahoo in the past 10 years has gone down to nothing. Google has made them nothing. Well, and I would, assert, I would assert, too, that outside of certain formats, like maybe their Shine format uh, is one that has been talked about as being successful, which is like an area of their website that's like specifically geared towards women. Yahoo has very little to offer the rest of the web yeah. uh, because they, they're, they, fall, they fell behind. Sure, they did. And, yeah. and, you know, while we're talking about these uh, different trademark or patent infringements and all, there's still a big one with Google and Apple coming up very shortly. It's been on the docket for a while and it's finally going to be coming up to be heard regarding the pinch and zoom feature on any touchscreen device that both Google with their Android system and of course Apple has with their i systems. Apple is suing Google for patent infringement for the pinch and zoom Everything that I've heard and read in my talk, uh, tech channels say it doesn't look good for Google with this suit. Apple intends that if they win the lawsuit, there will be a cease and desist from Google being able to use Pinch and Zoom. And if you can't use Pinch and Zoom on any Android devices anymore, Apple just successfully killed that system. So these are, these are interesting lawsuits coming down the pike here. Well, and I think, but I think things have just gotten so competitive in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. And it's I, very cutthroat. There, yeah, there, there is some, there is some precedence. There is some, and there are some people who believe that there is proof that Google had this technology first, actually, and that it would be Apple who would be on the infringing side. But the problem is, is you know, even real Apple fans have basically started shouting, "Stop suing people." Yeah, well, that, that goes back to the old days with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates as well. Bill stole from Steve. Steve stole from Bill. That went back to the earliest days. And they both admitted it, you know, as Steve did while he was alive. Of course, Bill is still with us. They both admit it. Bill stole and Steve stole. Yeah, well, and that, but I mean, that's the nature of technology is one, one thing has to build on other things and things that, and, you know, it's just like in uh, any kind of intellectual property, things expand a certain amount. You know, you may gather inspiration from different places, but as long as there's one change, it's not necessarily the same thing. And I think in technology, because things are advancing so quickly, it's very difficult to tell what came from where. It's going to overlap. Things are going to overlap. And part of the problem yeah. is that Apple would get, would develop technology. Steve Jobs, God rest his soul, would not want to go any farther than it was. Somebody else takes it farther. Now they want to sue. So we don't know what the story is behind it. Yeah. Well, let the courts decide this. Uh, now, there's we have another tech story here in case anybody wants to get this is one I want uh, Ed might want to get into, but people want Apple to be responsible for the bad deeds of its app makers. Anybody well, wanna... I'm going to take Holly's side on this. I'm going to jump onto the Google Android bandwagon for this one. It's not just Apple. Google has done the same thing. So, you know, you, you look at Apple, Apple is actually tightly controls their app store. Apple has to approve every app that goes into the app store. Whereas mm -hmm. Google and their Android system, it's open source and they're cracking down now, Google is, because there's been a good number of viruses and malware and everything in their app store. So they are starting to pull more and more apps off of it now. A matter of fact, they just had a big renaming of their app store. It's now called the Play Store and all yeah, of all of and all of their apps now are play something like play movie, yeah. play music. It's all on this play. Well, that goes into another lawsuit. That's one of the initial Apple slash Google lawsuits where Apple said, we have the rights to the term app store. You guys can't use it. And the courts ruled in their favor and Google was forced to change the name of their app store to the play store. So, you know, here you go again. This is just 
a round robin, a, a, a circle of who's suing who. I agree with Holly. This is where I was going to say I agree with Holly and the Apple fanatics that say, look, you know, enough with the lawsuits already. We're both going to coexist in, in this environment for X number of years. Nothing lasts forever in technology. Who's to say that Google or Apple or the iOS or the Android operating system will even be in existence 10 years from now? Things change in technology. But that being said, that we have to coexist for right now. Let's just coexist. Uh, again, like Holly said, you have overlapping technologies here that you can't do anything about. Quit this baloney over suing each other over the smallest little things. I mean, small to us, I don't know. One of these uh, mil uh, lawsuits might be worth millions or billions of dollars. So who are we to say it's a small, minute point? It could, you know, these lawsuits could be worth millions and billions, but ir irrelevant to the average tech user, that's for sure. Yeah, but you know, the, the funny part about it is that even though they call it the Play Store, it's still apps. People are still going to call them apps. That's what they're going to call. That's what they're calling. Well, yeah, but you, you can't. It's, they it's like, they had to like, change the name of the store. Well, they had to change the name of the store, but what happened? That's like you know, you go out to a a, a store, a grocery store, and you buy sterile. Bandages. They still call, we call. I go out and go, I buy band aids, and band aids is a brand name. But I right. don't buy band. My wife buys Curad. There's still band aids, and right. band aid is a brand name. But by band aid John, is a brand Johnson. name. So sure. You know, well, hey Fred, remember a while back you said you bought new eyeglasses? Yes. That's why you paid so much for your eyeglasses. Because I got to pay Apple. <laughs> yeah, because they're eyeglasses. <laughs> Can I get sued twice because I have two eyes? <laughs> Sue me twice. Yeah, that's lie. probably the next suit. They're gonna yes. they're gonna sue uh, Cohen Fashion Optical or something. You're not gonna be able to call them eyeglasses anymore. You know what? Instead of cutting each other's throats, call, like, I don't think they can work together. Do what? Sorry, go ahead, Gene. Instead of cutting each other's throats, they need to work together. Uh, they're gonna be for their benefit point. as well as the uh, consumer. That's my point. And they are on opposite ends of the spectrum get Android products really inexpensively, and you have to pay through the nose for Apple products. So you're appealing to a different crowd anyway. You're already talking apples and oranges, so live in peace. What's <laughs> next? Thanks, Father Ed. What's next? I agree. Well, we got a lot of technical news today. Our last two stories are both uh, highly technical, and the next one involves PayPal. Yeah, yeah Ed's <laughs> favorite subject, PayPal. Oh, yeah. I'd My like favorite PayPal. monetary organization. <sighs> so what do you PayPal think, so what do you think about this, Ed? PayPal uh, inventing a card reading device? It's, it's nothing new. Other, other people have had it for a good number of years now. It's just that PayPal is so prevalent as a, I'll call it money trading organization, you know, where money switches hands. It's so prevalent in providing their service that why not be able to swipe credit cards and it goes right into your PayPal account. So I'm not a PayPal user and will never be a PayPal user. But for people that do, sure, it's there's a benefit to this. Swipe a credit card and it goes right into your PayPal account. Well, what I thought was really but they're, interesting. No, they're, they're not first, though. Well, what I thought was really interesting is they're actually starting to aim this at retail, at businesses. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's because regardless of what I think about PayPal, it is a uh, very widely used service. People love it. People hate it. But the people that use it, it's, this is almost an Apple Android kind of thing as well, a love-hate relationship. But the people that use PayPal, which is by the masses, all of the other types of services like uh, Google Checkout and so on and so forth, they lag way, way, way behind PayPal. PayPal is the forefront leader in that technology, in this money-changing technology. So, sure, why why not retail? You know, it seems like I use the, the term everybody, although it's not everybody because I don't have a PayPal account, but everybody has a PayPal account, and I know that you could get PayPal credit or debit cards attached to your PayPal account. So that being said, why not be able to go to your local hardware store and, you know, obviously you can with your PayPal debit or credit card anyway, but why not be able to have that store, you know, directly 
bill to your PayPal, attach themselves to your PayPal account, and well, it's it's the next step in that evolution. Say so what I like about it, you know, being an ex-business owner myself is you can be very much mobile with this because, you know, when I had my business, I used to have to have a credit card machine and you know all this printing stuff and everything. Now you just now swipe the card right on your thing, cell phone. Yeah, you just have to put it on your cell phone, and bam, it goes into your account. You got paid, and uh, you don't have to worry about all this extra equipment carrying around with you and everything. So and I that was great. my point. That, that stuff is very expensive, especially for small startup businesses. I know a guy in Pennsylvania here who has a, um, a, a mechanic shop in uh, East Bangor. And to set up his initial stuff was like almost $4,000. Being able to go to his Android phone or his – you know, whatever phone it is for PayPal would make it. I mean, that's a $4,000 savings going directly into his account. And, you know, a lot of these, these, uh, other, other services, whoever they are, are, are charging you a, a exorbitant fees where they may exactly. not, where they're probably not going to charge it. But I, like Ed said, a lot, of, I have a PayPal account, but it's hooked up and I don't keep any money in it. If I buy something on eBay, it you takes put money into it. Account. PayPal is simply a service to take the money from one to the other because that's how restricted right. I am on it. But I know people who come into my office want to pay me, want to pay other organizations. They use it as a banking a bank account. They, they use it as a, as a bank. They use it as a, a, as a credit card for eBay. I know a guy who's got a credit card. Here, boom, put on a credit card. And they may keep the money separate, but it is what it is. You're earning points off it. So some people like it. Some people hate it. I, I, I consider it a necessary evil because I don't have to keep any money in it. And it's easy for me to you know, keep track of what's going on for the credit card. You know, for me, it's necessary, but I use it as little as possible. I'm not happy with PayPal, but I use it as little bit as possible. And Holly, I we got sidetracked, but what were, your, what were your thoughts? Well, I mean, I just thought it was really interesting that, they, uh, that they're that they spinning into uh, real retail, because I also wonder, I mean, I guess there there will always be a place for sort of a place to pick things up on the go in person. But, I, I mean, I just wonder if this will, because, you know, there's so many, like, credit card fees and all this stuff, and people have these credit card machines that dial through a phone line, mm -hmm. and I, I just wonder if this isn't a really easy solution, especially for small businesses going forward, and sort of cost-effective as I well. I think it is. I'm, I'm all I think for it. Is you know, whether it's PayPal or any other company, I, uh, I'm certainly in favor of the technology and the use of it. And I'm sure the other guys are going to follow suit, or will they get sued by somebody for that? They'll probably get sued. <laughs> oh, That'll be lawsuit. something else for us to discuss. Yeah, we'll, we'll have another show. There you go. Okay, and for our science segment today, a, a first neutrino message sent through the ground. Now, if people don't know what neutrinos are, neutrinos are extremely tiny particles with almost zero atomic ma uh, zero mass and, and a neutral charge. They pass through solid objects without losing any speed or any uh, mass or anything. They can pass, and they pass through the Earth all the time. Ooh, 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 could I go? Yeah. And scientists... <laughs> they, yeah, like they, were, they were... Over the past couple of years, they were saying they were now going against Einstein's theory that neutrinos actually could go faster than the speed of light. Well, just this past week, I read a report of two independent studies that said no neutrinos cannot exceed the speed of light. So for there, there was big excitement in the science world over the past couple of years that neutrinos could go faster than the speed of light. Two independent studies very recently said no, they don't. Anyway, they don't. Go ahead. But, Back to your story. But, anyway, like they said, that's all I know about neutrinos. Yeah. They're extremely tiny particles with almost zero mass and neutral charge. Thus, so they're, they're impervious to electromagnetic waves or impervious to gravity. So what they did, they went into an ex uh, a particle accelerator called the uh, at the Fermi National Acceleration Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois. They called them NUMI particle accelerator. They shot them and they, made, they were able to send out the word NUMI. This would be exciting. This, this may be the future of telecommunications and all kinds of communications. I think it's a great idea. And it's something that we, we probably won't see for the next 40 or 50 years. But what a, what a way to go. I mean, what, 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 this is great. I find stuff like this exciting. That well, it would have been nice. even more exciting if neutrinos did go faster than the speed of light because right now the fastest technology we have, uh, fiber optics, which is the speed of light, limited to the speed of light. If neutrinos did go faster than the speed of light, then you would have a new exciting technology. But if these 
like I said, if these new independent studies hold up, where no, that's not the case, well, so then, for better or worse, we're still stuck with the speed of light. Which is still pretty darn fast, Which is actually, still so. pretty darn fast. Yeah. Fred, do you know what the speed of light is? Yeah, it's 186,000 miles per second. That's pretty darn fast. That's fast. And the thing is, I don't think that there is nothing right now that does go faster than the speed of light. Because once they say, once you go past the speed of light, you wind up having all kinds of problems and I don't know. But speed of light, that, that, I mean, a light year is the distance light travels in a year. So figure it out. I mean, if you can figure that out, 186,000 miles per second in a year, that's a long way. Sure is. So, but I find this kind of stuff exciting, so. I totally have, I don't understand this at all. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't that's, understand. That's why you're in business. Yeah, this is very confusing to me. I need to hire That's why she watches place. Dancing with the Stars. And I watch Nova. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I also watch the History Channel, but that doesn't help me any with this. No, 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 I watch the History Channel, too. I, I, ha I have a science there. background. That's why I know about this. I watch stuff. True TV. I'm learning nothing except <laughs> except how idiots <laughs> try to steal saves HD. that are bolted or to the like ground. Or like Discovery ID. I, I really, I can get into some investigate. <laughs> Actually, in um, in all honesty, I have to admit I watch tend to watch C-SPAN and cable news a lot more than I watch anything else. I'm just a 100% news junkie. <laughs> we need that too. I still time for Adam Twelve and Dragnet. <laughs> you mentioned Dragnet. What about oh. Dragnet? Yeah, so Gene's, Gene's, Gene's in the land of Dragnet. So what else do we have? Anybody have anything? I think that's, uh, that finishes our list for today, yeah? Boys? Yeah, I think we're done. Finish it for you, Fred? I'm finished as well. Wow. So it's good to have Holly back in the fold. Absolutely. Yay. And as I said, make sure everybody takes a listen to next Friday's Crashing Glass podcast for the further adventures of Holly's trip to China. <laughs> and in closing, we're always amiss, and we keep forgetting to thank... Our good friend Peter Prince for our theme music for As We See It. It's actually the theme music for our old show After Dark. The theme song's name is actually even After Dark. However, since After Dark is in a hiatus type you know, position right now, we've hijacked the theme song for As We See It. So regardless, we want to thank Peter Prince for our theme song, After Dark. And we will be hearing that on top of Gene's little closing of our show, which you will hear momentarily, because in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. And in Pennsylvania, in the Pocono Mountains, I'm Fred Boas. And here in St. Louis, once again, I'm Holly Hurley. And, of course, let's not forget about Larry the Lobster, who joined us earlier in the show from Brookline, Massachusetts. And from Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. We thank you so much for joining us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. We look forward to you joining us next week for another As We See It, right here on Basenet Television. <laughs>